have you. I'm blessed to have you share with the uh, subscribe to our channel. And uh, welcome to this second part of our topic, which has been the womb of grace. And I believe last Sunday was a blessing to you as we shared the first part of this series. And I believe this second part will be a blessing to you also. And uh, you will continue sharing. You will continue uh, having to listen to what the Lord is ministering to our heart. Thank you so much. And uh, continue sharing. Continue subscribing. Those who have not subscribed to the series. And God will bless you. I want us to welcome our pastor, Pastor David, to continue with the second part of our series. And uh, I believe God will bless you. This is Christ Fellowship Chapel where Christ takes the preeminence of our worship. God bless you. Ah, praise Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of you who have been supporting this broadcast. We do not take it for granted. Thank you for allowing us to bring this message to where you are. Uh, thank you for subscribing to our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so, I would encourage you to subscribe so that you can get more content from us. Thank you for, for those who have... For, for the servants of God who have done a lot of work in spreading the gospel, I know it is not easy, but may you be encouraged. Continue doing what you're doing. Do not be discouraged with the, with, the, with the current situation. Continue spreading the gospel. Thank you for those who have been following. I've received very, uh, uh, very positive remarks. Thank you so much for encouraging us. Thank you for sending anything that you have to support this broadcast. I cannot thank you enough. And I know that God in heaven is going to reward you. Uh, uh, we have been studying about the womb of grace from last week. Uh, we started from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 5. And I'm going to do a short recap so that we can get the flow of this part. The Bible says that those who are full have hired themselves out for bread. And the hungry have ceased to hunger. Last week we saw that this is Hannah rejoicing. Rejoicing and thanking God for what he had done to her or for her. The Bible continues to say, and we say that we are going to emphasize on this. And our teaching, the three-part teaching, will come from these two sentences. That even the barren has born seven. And she who has many children has become feeble. These two scriptures are very po profound. These two sentences in this scripture, they are very profound. They carry a lot of information inside it. And we have been studying our womb because we saw that Hannah means grace. And a womb is where life develops before it is born. And we saw that each and every one of us, we have a womb of grace. And there are things that God have, has put inside us. We may not give birth to Samuel, but for sure we have the ability to give birth to an anointing. We saw that our firstborn is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We even saw that the secondborn is identity. The firstborn, which is the anointing, gives us the, 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 the leeway. I remember our, 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 our parents used to say that that uh, when they're introducing uh, their elder brother or sister, they used to say that if him or her would have taken the life of my mother, I wouldn't be born. So I'm going to use the same analogy for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to give your life to Christ so that the Holy Spirit can come and indwell in you. And then the other children will come after this. We saw that the second born is the anointing, is the anointing for identity. We saw that the second born is the anointing for identity. That when we have the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we are able to know who, you, who we are. We are not going to suffer from identity crisis, from midlife crisis. We saw that the third born is the anointing of purpose. That if you don't know why you are here, you don't know why you're here. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will show you what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. And then we went and ended there. So today I'm going to, re to, to, to take it up from there and go straight to the fourth one. The fourth one I would, like, I would like us to see that is the vision that God gives us. 
initially from the from the past part from the from the past part which we discussed last week if you haven't watched it just go and watch it and watch it again because i'm going to recap a lot from the first part of this series we saw that when you have the anointing one of the things that the anointing gives you is vision the anointing gives you vision proverbs chapter 29 verses 18 says that where there is no vision the people perish but he that keepeth the law happy is he where there is no vision people perish where there is no vision people perish i want to emphasize on that where there is no vision people perish if you don't have a vision for your life young men if you're looking for a wife have a vision let her be attracted by your vision not by the car that you're driving not by the money that you have right now let her be attracted by your vision young girls don't be attracted by cars and material things they all disappear but a vision will outlive the vision bearer it will go for generations when you have a vision that is tying you together as a couple it is very difficult for you to fight because the vision will be taking you back to where you're supposed to be when a woman comes into a man's life she helps him to attain this vision as the woman if you don't see yourself in the vision of this man please don't bother no no matter how handsome this man may be no matter how tall he may be or dark don't bother don't bother with him if you don't see yourself in that vision don't bother you will be you will live a life of hell and fighting and we don't want that what is a vision what is a vision a vision i've taken this from the dictionary that a vision is the act of seeing external objects that is actual sight a vision is also something imagined to be seen though not yet real that is what i want us to dwell in because the bible says that we should not walk by sight but we should walk by faith i want to dwell on something imagined to be seen though not yet real it is only the holy spirit that can give you that when you see it is very important to note that when you look at the story of abraham when he was journeying with with lot his nephew from the book of genesis chapter 13 verses 14 to 15 god told abraham when they were parting ways that all the land that you can see i will give it to you all the land that you can see i will give it to you when you read the book of genesis chapter 15 verses 1 to 6 i'm not going to read it i'm going to summarize with one sentence that the stars of heaven will be as much the number of your children i want to put this bold statement to you that god will never give you anything if you cannot perceive it he will tell you as far as your eyes can reach that is what i'm going to give you so if you don't have a vision then you're going to perish i'm asking you today humbly receive jesus christ as your personal savior let the holy spirit come and anoint you so that the holy spirit can give you a vision from from the scriptures that we have just taken uh, as an example of abraham verses 6 of genesis chapter 15 verses 1 to 6 we see that it takes humility righteousness and faith to get to your vision when the holy spirit gives you that vision you must be hu humble because the holy spirit will give you real time directions and it takes humility for you to take that direction the bible says in that verse that abraham believed he believed in what god told him and it was counted to him as righteousness so it takes faith it takes righteousness and humility to get to your vision now i want us to see a few types of visions because so that we can know whether we have vision that has come from the holy spirit or not the first one i would like to call it intellectual vision 
intellectual vision. This is where you go to school, you read about engineering, and then you get a vision from engineering and from what you have read. Yeah? We also have social vision. This is a vision that you get. And this, mind you, these are personal visions. These ones are not from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not depend on engineering. He is the one who created that engineering. He gives you a vision to create it. Hmm? Now, we have social vision. This is what you get from your social circles, what you discuss with people. You may tap a vision that is not yours. That is the danger of such, a, of such kind of a vision. We also have emotional vision. An emotional vision. You can be driven by, emotional, by, 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 by emotions, or rather, you can be driven by emotions and decide that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. The problem with that, emotions die. Sometimes they are high, sometimes they are low. So you will not be motivated to get to where you're supposed to be. And the last one that I would like us to look into is spiritual vision. This is the vision that comes direct from God through the Holy Spirit. And we are going to see a few examples. We are going to see a few examples in the Bible so that we can know, so that we can know when the Holy Spirit gives us a vision. I'm going to read a, 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 a scripture from Revelation chapter 9, verses 7 to, uh, to 10. This is the Apostle John who has been given visions by God. He didn't know what he was writing. He knew some, some he knew, some he didn't know because the Bible says in Revelation, when you start it, the Bible says that which the angel talked to Apostle John and signified these things to him. It shows that the angel used symbols to signify some scriptural truths. And the scripture says that, verse 7, the shape of the locust, I want us to read it very slowly so that you can create the image in your mind. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. These are horses prepared for battle. When horses were prepared for battle, they were, they were, they were harnessed with, with some clothing on their head. Some even had helmets. Some had leather. I, 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 I can't remember what, what, what we call, is it a saddleback? I think it's a, it's, it's a saddleback when they are preparing to go for war. The, the, the scripture continues to say, Apostle John says that on their heads were crowns of something like gold and their faces were like, were, were like the faces of men. Paint that picture in your head. Verses 8, they had hair like women's hair. And their teeth were like a lion's teeth. Verses 9. And they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron. The only thing that I can think about, body armor. A body armor. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots. The sound of chariots. With many horses running in battle. The only sound that I, I can imagine is a helicopter that can produce such a sound of chariots, eh? many chariots running. And they had tails like scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months. Brethren, Apostle John knew what a scorpion is. He lived in a desert country. That's where you find scorpions. And that is the closest thing that he could imagine of what he saw. But God was giving him a vision of what is to come. Let's look at another scripture. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 3. And then we are going to jump to verses 8. The Gentiles shall come to your light. And the kings to the brightness of your rising. Verses 8 says that, Who are these who fly like a cloud? Paint that picture. This is Prophet Isaiah writing. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves on their roosts? The New Living Translation says, verses, verses, verses 8, that, and what do I see? Isaiah cannot put his head around what he's seen. And what do I see flying like clouds to Israel, like doves to their nests? If it were me, I would think probably that's an aeroplane. 
Probably. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. The Bible says, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. There was a great earthquake with noise. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Sackcloth of hair. Put, paint that picture in your head as we continue. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. That is what Apostle John knew. That is also echoed in Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 25. That, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers of heavens will be shaken. If I were to, I, I, I were, I were to imagine, I would imagine things like bombs and missiles giving thick clouds of smoke. But if, 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 if I were living in, in the days of Apostle John, I would write the same thing. Let's read another one. Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 to 9. This is still Apostle John saying that when they finish their testimony, these are the two witnesses, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, the two witnesses, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those prophets, sorry, those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, this is everyone in the world, will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into a grave. That is only possible through what we are doing right now. Live streaming. Through the internet. Through technology. So Apostle John was seeing things that he didn't understand. God was giving him visions of very many years to come that he didn't understand. There is Revelation chapter 13 verses 15. The Bible says that he was granted power, this is the beast, to give breath to the image of the beast. He had created an image of the beast which was injured. And then he was given power to give breath to this image. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as will not worship the image of the beast to be killed. I asked myself, who is the only person who can give breath of life? Is it not only God? And then, as I was thinking about this scripture, I realized that these days we create robots. We create technology. We have very high-tech technology. Probably Apostle John was being shown these things, but his brain was not advanced enough to get to that level. I'm going to give one last example. That in Nahum chapter 2 verses 4, that the chariots, the chariots rage in the streets. Paint that picture in your head. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. In the broad roads. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches and they run like lightning. Horses cannot run like lightning. But these days we have advanced technology of vehicles running like lightning. With their torches wide open, jostling one another in a jam, in broad roads. To me, I would think it's a highway. Those are what I call visions from above, visions from God. What are we supposed to do with the, with the visions that God, that God can give us? Number one, I'm going to retrieve this from the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. I know this is a very popular scripture, but we are going to get a few lessons from it. The Bible says that I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart 
Rampart is a protected place, a fenced place, and it is high in height. So the first thing that you're going to do, you're supposed to be high in spirit and protect yourself in isolation with the Holy Spirit and watch to see what He will say to me. What He, with a capital H, that is God, is the one who gives visions. It will come from God. And I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision." Write it down. When God gives you a vision, write it down. What does that do? It, it, it makes it a covenant between you and God. It's like signing a document. Write it down and make it plain on tablets. Your vision should be very simple to understand. Don't make it complex. If it is so complex, then it is not a vision. Make it plain on, 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 on tablets. And it means that when you're writing it on tablets, it is something that is going to live forever. That he may run who reads it. Notice, underline that. He may run who reads it. That vision is not for you. It is for the people around you. Your children, your spouses, your generation. The vision that God is giving you is not yours primarily. It helps accelerate the life of people around you. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. You must have, vision, you must have patience. You must have patience for this vision to come true. Patience is key for a vision to mature. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. A vision speaks truth. Truth brings life. A vision brings life to the people around them. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Then I'll conclude by saying, verses 4, Behold the proud, you need humility. His soul is not upright. You need righteousness in him. But the just shall live by faith. You need faith to attain your vision. And I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dive straight into the fifth bone, um, whom I call destiny. In the first part we saw the anointing for destiny. And I'm going to read from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6. From the New King James Version, this is a scripture that Paul wrote to his son, to his spiritual son, Timothy. And he was saying that, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. And I would like to ask myself, I like asking myself, how am I going to leave this world? Because that is our destiny. In one way or another, we are all going to die. But how are you going to die? I really love the way Christ left this earth. The Bible says that, he poured his spirit out. He knew when he's going to die. The Bible also says that no one can kill the son of man. Except he himself offers himself up. Our destiny should be an acceptable offering to God. We should end our lives here on earth in a pleasing way to God. Just as Jesus Christ poured out his spirit. What do we require to get our, to, our, to our destinies? Number one, we need diligence. We need diligence. The Bible says from Proverbs chapter 14, verses 23, that in all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. We need diligence. But it is very important to note that you also need wisdom. In that diligence, you need wisdom. Don't be diligent in foolishness. Be diligent in wisdom. So the second thing, what you need is wisdom. And I'm going to read from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 10. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. That is diligence in foolishness. But wisdom brings success. So you need to be diligent in wisdom. For example, I'm going to give an example. The donkey and the lion. I remember um, our, our, our teacher in primary school used this example very many times, that if working hard pays, then the donkey should have been the king of the jungle because the lion sleeps all day and waits for the lioness to bring meat for it to, to, to eat. But the donkey works every day, 24 hours. So if this hard work pays, then the donkey should be the king of the jungle. 
but I don't want to get it twisted. Hard work pays, but only in wisdom, not in foolishness. Number three, learn godly patterns through mentorship. I will give an example of Elijah and Elisha. When you see when they were walking, when, they were, when, when, when Elijah was going to be taken away by the fiery uh, uh, chariots, by the whirlwind, sorry, by the, by the whirlwind. When they got to Jordan, Elijah used his mantle to divide the river Jordan. When Elisha was coming back after his mentor was taken up to heaven, he did the same thing because of the mentorship that he had through Elijah. So we need mentorship to learn godly patterns for us to get to, your, to our destiny. The other very important thing that we need is favor. From the book of Luke chapter 2 verses 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. We need favor. Even Samuel, there is somewhere it is written that even Samuel grew with favor, in wisdom, and favor with God and men. We need favor from God and favor from our fellow human beings. Lastly, we need networks. We need networks. The book of 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 6, when I, when, 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 when I talk about networks, I like giving this example. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. This lady wanted a miracle from the prophet. And the prophet told her to go and borrow uh, jars where, 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 where she can be able to put oil. And the Bible says clearly that when she said that there is not another vessel. The oil ceased. So it means that her blessing was directly proportional to the number of people that she knew. Was directly proportional to her networks. If she would have known more people, then she would have the capacity to, to hold more oil, more blessings. So our blessings are related to networks. You may be very gifted. You may, you may have the strength, the money, but if you don't have networks, you will be stuck for a very long time. The same with favor. You may be talented, but if you don't have favor, you may end up staying with that talent. So we need all those five to get to our destinies. Let, let's go directly to our sixth bond, which I would like to call Thanksgiving. He's the last bond. Uh, uh, the last biological uh, child to, to Hannah, to our womb of grace, and that is thanksgiving. That is when Hannah went now to start giving thanks to God. We have to cultivate a culture of thanksgiving. The Bible says in Luke chapter 17, verses 15 to 19, that and one of them, this is now Jesus after cleansing the lepers, the ten lepers, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Very important. You can underline that glorified God, and he was a Samaritan. It seems that there is a connection between thanksgiving and glorifying God. When he came back and told Jesus that I'm thankful, it was interpreted as glorifying God. And he was the only Samaritan. It means that the Samaritans were, were viewed as idol worshippers. They were not accepted by the Jews. So even spiritually, they were far away. Verse 17 continues to say that, So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the, are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. I can also put it to you that thanksgiving is also connected to faith. In other translations, it says that your faith has made you whole. It means that his spiritual condition was restored. Leave alone his physical condition. Because of thanksgiving, his spiritual condition was restored. He was no longer a Samaritan. He became a child of God. The book of John chapter 6 verses 11 to 14 the Bible says that, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. And the disciples to those sitting down, 
and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. Verses 12. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Is, is lost. Excuse me. I want you to notice something very important. Jesus gave thanks for what he had. And I would like to put a statement outside there that when you give thanks to what is not enough, God makes it more than enough. God makes it more than enough. Thanksgiving turns a situation that is not enough and turns it to a situation that is more than enough. So let us learn our culture of giving thanks. One of the things that we are taught when we are young, when we are, we, we, we are growing up, is to say thank you. Just a simple word as thank you is very important. And the last point that I would like to say is that thanksgiving brings fellowship. It was out of the thanksgiving that Jesus made that the multitudes were able to share bread and the fish with the disciples and Jesus Christ. Fellowship brings oneness. There is a statement that was put outside there that you are what you eat and whom you eat it with. Eating is very important. We have also adapted this culture in our church that we fellowship through breaking of bread. A simple act as that makes us have genuineness of heart because of fellowship. Thanksgiving brings this fellowship. Lastly, I would like to rush into the last son, the last child that Hannah adapted from Penina. And I would like to call the seventh born of Hannah, restoration. I would like to tell you that God is in the business of restoring lost souls. That's why you will find very many times in the Bible, he says, repent. It means go back to where you are. Repent. Pent is a higher place. It's a high raised place. Go back to that place. Restore. Redeem. Go back. God is in the business of restoration. It doesn't matter whether you feel that you've lost your vision. It doesn't matter whether you feel that you've lost your purpose. I would like to give you this good message of hope. That the blood of Jesus Christ is able to restore back. When that blood was shed on Calvary, it gave back life to those things that were dead. The Bible says that life is in the blood. When you read your Bible in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12, chapter 12 verses 23, the Bible says that only blood is in the life of a thing. And also that is also echoed in Genesis chapter 9 verses 4, that only you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. So God affirms to us that the blood of Jesus Christ carried life. And I would like to encourage each and every one of you that when you accept this blood, you will be restored back to life. Your destiny will be restored back to life. Your womb will be restored back to life. And you will be able to give birth to these seven children that we have, talken, we, 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 we have talked about. May God bless you. May God be with you. And I feel the Holy Spirit leading me to pray with someone who feels that they need to give back their life back to Christ. So that the blood of Jesus can wash you clean, can cleanse you, and then the anointing of the Holy Spirit can come and indwell in you. So that you can be able to give, back, to give birth to these children that we have been talking about. I would urge you and ask you with humility... Just close your eyes, believe, join your faith with mine as we pray this very short prayer in Jesus' name. Just repeat after me. Don't mind anyone who is around you. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I have heard your word and I have believed in my heart that you died on the cross for my sake. Today, I am confessing with, your, with my mouth that I believe that you died and rose up again for my sake. Wash me, cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit of the living God, come and indwell in me. Guide me to walk in ways that are pleasing to you. Guide me to my destiny. Give me back 
the children that are held in my womb of grace. That I will be able to give birth to my purpose, to my destiny, to my vision that has been ordained by you, to my identity, and that you will give me the grace of having a thanksgiving heart. Come and indwell in me and help me, O oh Lord, to walk in your ways. For it is in Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen and amen. If you, if you, had, if you have made that short prayer, I believe and you should believe that you are now born again. Get yourself to a Bible-based church and get a family of believers that will help you grow in ways that are pleasing to God. May God bless you. May God be with you. Till we meet again next week, may God keep you. I love you with the love of Christ. Amen and amen.